the New Inquisition. This is Robert Anton Wilson's tirade against fundamental materialism and the social, political, and religious attempts to limit our freedoms. It's uh, great to be back in Boulder, the capital of guaranteed drug-free urine samples. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I I live in Ireland, you know. That was the first thing I heard when I got off the plane in New York, is that uh, all the guaranteed drug-free urine samples come from P.O. boxes in Boulder. <laughs> and it aroused intense curiosity in me. I was wondering how they find drug-free urine in Boulder. I, I, I suspect they go to Longmont and capture people, <laughs> capture people from the Republican Club there and hold them prisoner until they get a gallon out of them or, or something like that. It's really a, a tremendous experience uh, uh, to come in over the Atlantic in a plane and look down and see the Statue of Liberty with those noble words and think of Jefferson and Madison and Adams and Washington and all those cats and then find out that the government is conducting unlicensed uh, searches and seizures inside people's bladders. And, and the population is standing for that. George Orwell and Franz Kafka should be alive. They should come back and see this. There's nothing, there's nothing in Kafka to, to compare to it. There, there, there really isn't. The great thing about being back in the States is I can't believe the newscasts here. It's, uh, it's like uh, reading surrealist fiction. The, the president can't remember the last time he conspired to commit a major felony. <laughs> and, but he's cool. And, uh, Reagan, is, Reagan is really cool about it. He says, can you remember what you were doing on August 8th or whatever the date was? And of course, none of us can. But if you put the question another way, can you remember when you committed your last major felony? I think, I think we could all remember that. I remember all the major felonies I've committed way back to 20 years ago. Oral Roberts has announced that God's going to kill him if he doesn't get four and a half million dollars, which, I, 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 that's such a great routine. Well, I, I, got, I, got, I got a pipeline directly to the Cather at the top of the Tree of Life, and uh, I, I got the word, uh, Oral is actually not going to die, he's going to mutate. He's, <laughs> he is, he's going to arrive at the next plateau up from Oral Consciousness, and he's going to change his name to Anal Roberts. <laughs> I, I, I love people like Oral Roberts. Uh, it's really fascinating uh, to turn the dial on the television and you get over past channel 40, uh, from 40 up to 60, you keep running into these people who are on there to tell you what God told them to tell you. <laughs> and, I, and I look at them and it's, it's absolutely a mind-blowing experience to think God sent out such a gang of idiots as that to tell me what, how I should live my life. And they can't even imagine what an hour of my life is like, and they're going to tell me how to run my whole life. I, I find it incredible. I, I think if God had something to tell me, he'd have the courtesy to pay a personal call and tell me himself instead of sending those uh, <laughs> idiots loose on us. Uh, but Reagan, uh, to return to uh, the libretto, uh, as it were, uh, uh, Reagan really is a wonderful president in a lot of ways. Uh, He's, he's the intelligent person's president, uh, just like uh, Johnson was the pacifist president. Uh, by starting the wrong war at the wrong time in the wrong place and fighting it with such vile anti-civilian weapons, he made pacifism more popular than ever. By 1968, 70% of the population opposed the Vietnam War. So I figured Johnson was the pacifist president. He, he was sent to convert most of the country to pacifism. And then we had Richard Nixon, who was the anarchist's president. <laughs> After five years of Nixon, everybody felt about the government the way only anarchists used to feel about it. <laughs> and, and, then, and then we got Gerald Ford, who nobody can even remember. I, I, go, I go around conducting these tests as I go around the country asking people, do you remember Gerald Ford? And they say, who? Uh, Ger Gerald Ford, he was the one who looked like the guy in the science fiction movies who's the first one to see the creature. <laughs> <laughs> And, that, and that's, that's about all anybody can remember about him. And then we had Jimmy Carter, who had the most powerful magnetic mystical initials in the Western world. 
but he had, a, he had to try to negotiate with the Ayatollah Khomeini, and that gets you nowhere. Uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini is a man who has a pipeline to Allah, and Allah tells him to tell everybody what to do, which includes killing all the members of Subud, you know, and uh, Baha'i and uh, other heresies like that. But uh, committing major felonies, uh, as I said, I can remember all the major felonies I've committed, and uh, it's a very interesting exercise. It might be a kind of yoga, even. Uh, to sit down sometime and, and figure out how many crimes you've committed in your lifetime and how many years in prison you'd get if they caught you every time. <laughs> and if, if, you don't, if you don't think you, you'd get at least a thousand years, look up the sex laws in every state you've lived in. Uh, you'll find just, uh, just, uh, just on your sexual behavior alone, you're good for about two thousand years in the joint. <laughs> and, and then when you consider the funny chemicals you may have fooled around with in your time, and uh, back in the Vietnam War, a lot of us were involved in uh, helping uh, draft resistors escape to Canada. Uh, I, can, I think it's safe to talk about that now. The statute of limitations has expired. And uh, if you start adding it all together, uh, if, you're, if you're a normal, decent human being, I think you're uh, subject to about 10,000 years in prison. <laughs> Which is an interesting commentary on government. Uh, uh, one of the things that I've never understood is these groups that rate legislators. They put out these sle uh, sheets rating legislators, and they rate them according to how many bills they enacted, whether they were there to vote on a bill and how many bills they wrote and all. The idea is that the more bills that get through Congress, the better off we all are, which is exactly the reverse of the view of Lao Tzu, who said the more laws we enact, the more criminals we produce. Actually, the more laws we enact, uh, the more we approach the situation of the anthill in uh, T.H. Uh, White's uh, Book of Maryland, where they had the slogan, everything not forbidden is compulsory. Uh, that's, that's why I always say uh, an honest politician is a national calamity. Uh, I mean, we can, we can stand the crooks. It's, it's a, a certain number of people always get their snout in the trough. That's uh, ordinary uh, mammalian politics, and uh, one expects it. But honest politicians keep writing laws. And uh, now that they're testing urine, how much further can they go? Uh, we've gotten past the point where everything not forbidden is compulsory. Soon we're going to arrive at the point where everything not compulsory is forbidden. And all this is in, the, in defense of the free world. Somebody asked me uh, outside to talk about Timothy Leary. Uh, Timothy Leary uh, was sentenced to 37 years in prison for poor usage of the First Amendment. Uh, that is, for shooting off his mouth about unpopular subjects. Um, I visited Leary quite a bit while he was in prison, and it was a fascinating experience. He was the freest man in the United States at that time. He absolutely refused to accept prison as a limitation on the freedom of his mind and his spirit. And uh, visiting him in prison was always a profoundly humiliating experience for me, and therefore a very powerful learning experience, because he was much happier than I was. And I thought, how can this guy be so happy when he's locked up in a cage like an animal? Uh, but uh, Timothy had learned something from uh, his many years as a psychologist, neurologist, and uh, acid head. And, uh, the interesting thing is that when uh, Dr. Leary was put in prison, uh, uh, the major protests against that came from artists, poets, uh, literary people. There was hardly any objection from the scientific community, even though the judge who sentenced Leary waved one of Leary's books in the air and said, this man's ideas are dangerous. So it was very clear that Leary was getting sentenced for his scientific ideas, and yet the scientific community didn't pay any attention at all. But that's hardly surprising. Um, Tim told me once that it was a turning point in his life when the books of Wilhelm Reich were burned in an incinerator in New York in 1957. I don't know how many people here are old enough to even remember that. It was a turning point in my life, too. Um, it actually happened uh, even before they started testing, uh, well, even before they started uh, testing urine. They, uh, uh, seized all the books of Dr. Wilhelm Reich from the Orgone Institute Press, which published them. They took all the books, put them in a garbage truck, drove them to an incinerator and burned them. Then they went up to Reich's laboratory in Wrangley and uh, uh, smashed all of his scientific instruments with axes. 
And uh, the total protest from the scientific community at that time amounted to 18 psychiatrists who signed a petition protesting against it. That changed, uh, Tim told me, that changed his whole attitude towards the psychiatric and psychological professions. And I think it changed my attitude, too. That's another one of the crimes I've committed in my long and uh, disgraceful life. I was sitting in an orgone box when that was illegal. Uh, the, the government declared that the orgone box was a dangerous consciousness-altering instrument. Or, no, actually, they claimed that the orgone box didn't work, so therefore you shouldn't sit in it because something bad might happen to you <laughs> because it didn't work. The, the funniest, uh, if you got my kind of a sense of humor, which is kind of surrealist and weird, the funniest thing about the whole Reich case is that just before he went to prison, he announced that he was going to use his orgone cloud buster to make a rainstorm in Maine. And he turned his orgone cloud buster on the clouds and rain came. And the total response from the scientific community to that has been to repeat for the last 30 years, it was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence. Uh, and, a, and a bolder audience, I don't have to define a mantra. You all know what a mantra is. This, this is the mantra of what I call fundamentalist materialism, which is what my new book, uh, The New Inquisition, is about. It's about fundamentalist materialism. I know it's more fashionable to attack fundamentalist Christianity right now, but I thought the fundamentalist materialists have been getting away with too much and somebody should... Uh, uh, sort of uh, reveal that they're out with no clothes on, like the King and Anderson's tale, and so I, st I started researching some of their more notorious bloopers. I assume you all know what I mean by fundamentalist materialism. It is that school of materialism which is like unto fundamentalist religion in that it is absolutely dogmatic and sure of itself in all respects and has no doubts about anything. Its main uh, propaganda arm in the United States is the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, otherwise known as PSYCOP for short. And uh, although they're opposed to all forms of mysticism and they regard everybody in Boulder as a nutcase, if you're not aware of that, you should be, uh, they have their own mantra. And it works just like an ordinary Hindu mantra. It quiets anxieties, it stills the restless mind, it ends the perpetual inquiring and questioning and wondering, and eventually it stops thought entirely. Uh, the, their mantra is, it was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence. So when Reich points his orgone buster, orgone cloud buster up there and gets a rainstorm, it was only a coincidence. Uh, curiously enough, there was a fellow working for the Weather Bureau at the time Reich was in prison. His name was Charles Kelly. I wonder, anybody here ever heard of Charles Kelly? Isn't it amazing how, one person in the isn't it too? Isn't it amazing how certain items of uh, historical uh, knowledge just disappear from the, uh, nobody knows about them? Charles Kelly was working for the Weather Bureau when Reich announced he'd make a rainstorm and the rainstorm happened. And apparently Charles Kelly uh, was not into mantra very heavily and he didn't repeat it was only a coincidence often enough to still doubts and quiet anxieties. He, he started repeating Reich's experiments. And he published a book called uh, New Method of Weather Control. He has photographs in the book of the results of his experiments with the cloud buster. And the photographs absolutely demonstrate that the cloud buster works or that Kelly is good at faking photographs. I don't know which happened in that case. It's amazing that since Kelly's book has come out, nobody else has published a set of experiments with the cloud buster. And yet there's absolute conviction, as far as I can find out throughout the scientific community, that Reich was a nut and the cloud buster doesn't work. And that is the power of a good mantra. Uh, the same thing applies to uh, parapsychology. For over a hundred years, in over a thousand universities now, all over the world, parapsychologists have been doing research on ESP, as it's called. I don't know whether it should be called ESP or we need another name for it. But there are mountains and mountains of this research and you get these runs of people guessing cards correctly at an incredible rate, way against uh, probability. And the response of the fundamentalist materialist is to repeat their mantra again. It was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence. And that's how all of the data for ESP, precognition, clairvoyance and so on, is disposed of. It was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence. 
that is only occasionally varied with it was sloppy research technique or somebody was cheating. Uh, James Randi, who is one of the leading uh, spokes entities for PSYCOP, uh, I say spokes entities to avoid human chauvinism. Uh, I don't want to say spokesperson because there's too much human chauvinism going around these days anyway. Uh, James Randi keeps insisting that the, the scientists at Stanford Research Institute who tested uh, Yuri Geller must have been collaborating with Geller to fake the results. Uh, the, that's, that's an extreme position. Randi is not entirely typical. Uh, the general response throughout PSYCOP is just to repeat the mantra, it was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence. In Ireland, in Kerry, there's a a reported six-foot rabbit that hides behind trees and only comes out uh, around midnight. Uh, this rabbit is called the puka. Maybe some of you have heard of the puka if you've studied Celtic lore at all. A uh, puka it comes from the same Indo-European root that we get the word God, by the way. Some people think that God was originally a giant rabbit back in the Stone Age, and the puka is the, uh, is the earliest form of the god idea in the Western world. I don't know if that's true, but uh, according to the residents of Kerry, the puka still lives there. And uh, if you're coming out of a pub around midnight, which is typical, Irish pubs officially close at 11.30, which means that at 11.30 the publican starts trying to throw the customers out. And on a good night, he gets most of them out by midnight. Sometimes it takes till 12.30, sometimes it takes till 1, sometimes they never close. But uh, when, the, when the cops are around, uh, the Garda, as they're called in Ireland, when the Garda are around, they get almost everybody out by midnight. And that's when the puka is inclined to jump out from behind a tree and scare the hell out of the people on their way home. And I got interested in the puka because there are so many fascinating stories about him, and uh, I especially am fond of uh, Kerry, County Kerry logic. I heard a County Kerry farmer being interviewed on Irish radio, and the interviewer, a Dublin University man, asked him, do you believe in the puka? And he said, that I do not, and I doubt much that the puka believes in me either. Uh, so that's... Uh, that, that, that's a relief from the rather monotonous mechanical logic of Psychop. Uh, I don't believe in the puka either, and I doubt that the puka believes in me. But it is curious that uh, in uh, England they've got a six-foot rabbit too in Cornwall. He's called Bunny Man, and he's, he's, uh, man, he's been reported for centuries. One of the most recent Bunny Man sightings was in an English magazine called uh, Common Cause uh, a couple of years ago. A woman coming home late from work saw a UFO in the woods and the light came toward her. The light was getting brighter and like many people who've had UFO experiences, she was frightened and started running and she ran right into the six foot tall white rabbit who said, please pray for me. Well, that's what she thought happened. That's, that's, her, that's her reality tunnel. That's how she could describe her experience that night. And uh, that, that got me interested in the whole science of lepufology. <laughs> Le lepufology is the conjunction of rabbits with UFOs. There's, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a, whole, there's a whole society devoted to studying lepufology. It's not just one of my fantasies. There's a group called MIBON, the Mutual Easter Bunny Observation Network. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a splinter off MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. There's a theory that UFOs are created by human expectations. Um, uh, Jacques Vallée is one of the uh, major uh, proponents of the theory that human belief systems create UFOs. And uh, Carl Jung had a variation on that theory in his book on flying saucers. So Mibon decided to see if human expectations would create Easter Bunny sightings. Uh, and they, they started uh, asking other people in the UFO uh, field, whatever that is, whether it's a hobby or a science or uh, a new religion, I don't know. But they started sending out questionnaires if people had any uh, Easter Bunny sightings for them. And they got back a lot of answers. People didn't have Easter Bunny sightings, but they had mysterious conjunctions, synchronicities, Jung would say. Mysterious conjunctions of UFOs and rabbits. 
For instance, there's a farmer in Isola, Italy, who says that a giant cigar-shaped UFO landed in his backyard. A bunch of dwarfs got out and they took all the rabbits from his rabbit hutch and took off. Uh, maybe UFOs come here to get the makings for rabbit stew. Uh, and then uh, J. Allen Heinrich, a uh, very distinguished astronomer, who was the uh, consultant to the Air Force's UFO investigation. Uh, Heinrich, in his book, The Edge of Reality, tells about a case in Iowa where at the site of a, a UFO sighting, where there was a burn mark on the ground, as is often found, all around the burn mark they found hundreds and hundreds of paralyzed rabbits. And on a more sinister note, uh, north, uh, north, north of Chicago, after a UFO sighting, they found uh, mutilated cattle, as is happening increasingly in these cases, UFO sightings and mutilated cattle, but they also found a beheaded rabbit. And uh, there's a case on record of a, an abductee, a woman who claimed to be abducted by a UFO. She said the pilot of the UFO was a giant rabbit. <laughs> we get uh, hundreds of millions of signals every second through our various sense organs and our brains orchestrate them in accordance with our reality tunnel, the way we prefer to put things together. That's why Samoans don't have exactly the same reality tunnel as Methodist uh, Republicans in Ohio, who don't have exactly the same reality tunnel as the Ayatollah Khomeini, who, do, who doesn't have exactly the same reality tunnel as the uh, group who are running China now and trying to decide whether they're communists or capitalists and keep changing every week, which I think is a very intelligent thing to do. It shows the profundity of the Chinese uh, people, uh, the yin and yang. Uh, but we, we all orchestrate things according to our favorite reality tunnel. Out of these millions and millions of signals, we put together these little holograms and project them outside and call that reality. And so I regard everybody's reality tunnel as interesting data in, in primate psychology. And uh, I, I don't uh, feel any particular belief that anybody's reality tunnel is entirely true, uh, including my own. I know what a nut I am. And uh, I don't think anybody's reality tunnel is completely wrong either. And my experience with mentally ill people is that their reality tunnel contains a great deal of truth, sometimes very painful truth. So I, I don't think there's any reality tunnel that's all right and any that's all wrong, so I'm not an Aristotelian thinker. So I take this data about lep lepufology as just an example of uh, an emerging reality tunnel. And it's appearing in the arts, too. Uh, the first UFO abductee was not a human being. The first UFO abductee was in a movie, and it was Bugs Bunny in uh, 1952. A 1952 movie called Hasty Hair, Bugs was kidnapped by a UFO. And that, that was about six years before the first human came forth to claim that a UFO ab, uh, abduction. And uh, if you see Spielberg's uh, E.T., the first shot you see is a rabbit before you see the UFO. Also, in uh, the old film, It Came From Outer Space with Richard Carlson, when the spaceship lands, the first thing you see is a rabbit running away. And uh, the, the, the lepufological uh, correlation is very deep. Uh, uh, the, the Fire Sign Theater and their uh, album, Not Insane, they have a letter in there from a rabbit and it's dated Deep Space. <laughs> While Psychop and the other fundamentalist materialists are busy denouncing parapsychology, there are much weirder things going on than ESP. People are having extraterrestrial terrestrial experiences with rabbits. And uh, then, then, there's the, then there's the great frog fall mystery. How many people here have read Charles Fort? Ah, well, you know about that. Frogs have been falling out of the sky forever. In ancient Greece, in, uh, in Narpleon, Greece, in uh, uh, the fourth century BC, they had a fall of frogs and fish that covered the whole town. People couldn't get their doors open. According to contemporary accounts, the town stank for three weeks afterwards from cleaning up the frogs and fish. And uh, in Russia, uh, just three years ago, in 1981, there was a major fall of frogs in uh, one part of Russia. Uh, the um, Gibraltar got them twice in this century alone. 1914, frogs fell all over Gibraltar. And in 1921, they came back and fell again. And uh, on the same city. Uh, 
It was only a coincidence. It was only a coincidence. It was only... I, I don't want anybody to get too alarmed. Every, if, if, if any of this starts freaking you out, just remember, it was only a coincidence. It was only a coincidence. The fact that there was a seven-year interlude in there, you shouldn't get mystical about the number seven. You especially shouldn't get as weird as me and think that's somehow connected with the fact that Joyce began Ulysses in 1914 and finished it in 1921. So the frogs came to announce the beginning and the end of Ulysses. It's only a coincidence that the heroine of Ulysses was born in Gibraltar, Molly Bloom. As so many frogs fell on Stenay in France in the Middle Ages that the Merovingian kings put the frog on their coat of arms, and you can still see it. Look up the coat of arms of the Merovingians. They got a frog, and that's because frogs fell out of the sky on Stenay, which was their capital. Snakes fell on Memphis, Tennessee a while back. The latest uh, fall of fish was in London only two years ago. They fell in Canning Town, uh, West Hempstead, uh, and around Haverstock Have Hill. Uh, the, whole, the general area where Jack the Ripper used to be active a uh, hundred years ago. A tremendous fall of fish. In, uh, in Kent, uh, they've had a fall of coins only a couple of years ago. Uh, in Russia, they had a fall of coins ten years ago in which the coins were all bent in the middle, as if Yuri Geller had been fucking around with them. <laughs> <clears throat> but it was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence, it was only a coincidence. There is a, a record of a farmer in uh, England who uh, heard a noise and went out to the stables and he found all the horses were turned around in their stalls and one horse was missing. So he hunted here and he hunted there. This is one of Charles Fort's cases. And finally he looked in the hay room. And the horse was in the hay room, even though the door was too small for the horse to fit through. I imagine he and the horse looked at each other with a wild surmise. <laughs> I, I, I know I would have. Ice of various sizes continues to fall out of the sky. In England uh, last year, there was an enormous chunk of ice fell on a golf course. Everybody saw, on the golf course saw there was no airplane. One of the conventional explanations is that the ice falls off the wings of airplanes. But if you start researching it, you find these falls of ice go back long before the airplane. There was one in India in the 19th century where the chunk of ice was as big as an elephant. There is, uh, the fundamentalist materialists have attempted to grapple with this. The explanation is the segregating whirlwind. Uh, most whirlwinds that uh, people have actually experienced, that you can find records of, the whirlwinds pick up all sorts of things and just scatter them all over the place, and down come birth certificates, coffins, kitchen sinks, parts of barns, dogs, cats, and this and that. But the... Uh, to handle the falls of frogs, there's a theory has been invented that some whirlwinds practice segregation. And so they run across the countryside rejecting everything else and pick up only frogs, and then they run to the nearest town and dump the frogs there. Uh, this, this has been soberly proposed. This was proposed by some scientists in Greece uh, in 1981 when they had a fall of frogs in Greece again. And they said it must have been a whirlwind that picked up only frogs. Although they did admit it was strange that the frogs were picked up by a whirlwind, hurled across space, dropped on the ground, and none of them were hurt. They were all hopping around in a very lively way. There are the cases of uh, alligators found in strange places. Everybody has heard about the alligators in New York sewers. There was an article in the American Journal of Folklore that had investigated the origins of that legend, and they found out that consolidated Edison workers who work in the sewers have seen alligators in the New York sewers. I don't know if they got there the way the legend says, kids putting alligators down the toilet when they got too big to play with anymore. Or how the, I don't know how the alligators got there, but a crocodile was found in Ohio once. Uh, two crocodiles were found in England uh, 20 years apart in a rural part of England. There's the Surrey Puma, which has been seen in Surrey, England for over 20 years now. Photographs of it have been taken. Scratch marks have been found and identified by the RSPCA as the scratches of a large feline weighing over 150 pounds. And yet no animals are being killed by this puma. Real pumas eat 150 pounds of meat a week but the Surrey Puma doesn't eat anything. Uh, the world is much stranger than most people realize. That's what I was getting at. But uh, 
Uh, let's, let's sober up a bit and stop rollicking around with frogs and crocodiles and talking bunnies and UFOs and things like that. Let's, let, let's look at hard science for a moment. Uh, the hardest uh, of hard sciences is mathematical physics, and the crown of mathematical physics is quantum theory. Uh, quantum mechanics is supposed to describe what the universe is ultimately made out of. And uh, the two major conclusions of quantum mechanics are that uh, the shorter the life of a particle, the more, t the more money it costs to produce it. <laughs> and so you can always get more money from the government to, to find more particles, just so there's always new ones being found. The, these very short-lived uh, particles are the basic building blocks of nature, but they can only be produced in the laboratory at great expense. So the basic building blocks of matter don't exist in nature. What does quantum mechanics say about reality? Well, quantum mechanics is just like religion. You got different sects. You don't have any uh, uniformity. The largest sect, uh, that's sect, not sex. I'm not talking about copulation. The largest sect is the Copenhagen School, which says that quantum mechanics can't say anything about reality. The largest school of thought among physicists is the Copenhagen School, and they say we can't talk about reality. And this is stated quite bluntly by uh, many physicists of that school. Physics does not talk about reality. It talks about what kind of equations are useful for us at this time. Questions about reality belong in somebody else's department. There are some physicists who don't like that. They say, why should we spend our whole life studying this subject if we can't say anything about reality at the end of all our study? So this minority has rejected the Copenhagen view and then started disagreeing with one another entirely about everything else. Among those who reject the Copenhagen view, there is the multiple universe people. Uh, this was started by John Archibald Wheeler and two uh, graduate students named Everett and Graham at Princeton back in the 1950s. It's called the EWG model for Everett, Wheeler, and Graham. That's the order in which they put their names on the paper in which they proposed it. And according to this model, everything that can happen to a quantum system does happen to it. This is one way of understanding the mysterious indeterminacy of quantum uh, processes. So therefore, everything that could happen uh, to any uh, quantum thingamajig, and you can't, you can't say a quantum particle uh, when you're among physicists because uh, they have two models for what's going on inside the atom, the particle model and the wave model. They use the particle model on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and the wave models on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and on Sundays they're agnostics like me. But the thingamajigs, whatever they are, the, the thingamajigs that act like waves in some experiments and act like particles in other experiments, everything that can happen to them does happen to them. And since we're made up of these thingamajigs, that means that everything that can happen to us does happen to us. And the EWG model proposes this literally. This is not science fiction. This is a legitimate theory in modern physics. You thought it just happened on Star Trek, I suppose. Everything that can happen to a quantum system does happen to us. So therefore, that everything can, that can happen to the universe does happen to it. So therefore, there are 10 to the 100th power universes uh, approximately at this point, with new ones that are coming into existence every nanosecond with every new alternative. Every time you have a quantum alternative, both of them happen. So in the universe next door, I'm not here tonight because uh, I was in a car accident on my way here. Isn't that terrible? That's sad to think about. Uh, then there's another universe uh, over there where I'm not here tonight because I never came to the United States on this lecture tour. I decided to stay in Ireland. And then there are other universes where I don't exist at all because my father never met my mother. There, I suppose there are universes where I was aborted. And uh, every one of these is equally real, uh, which is very much like the uh, Mahayana Buddhist saying, uh, existence and non-existence are the same. Uh, I exist, but I also don't exist. Uh, the, uh, one of the illustrations of this is the Schrodinger's cat paradox, about which I once wrote a novel, which a few people read. I, uh, I think it was, re it was uh, released on a need-to-know basis, <laughs> apparently it wasn't, it wasn't quite published, it sort of escaped. Uh, I will be immodest for a moment and tell you that new scientists call that novel the most scientific of all science fiction novels. That's one review I've always treasured. Anyway, the Schrodinger's cat paradox, which that novel is based on, is if you put a cat in a box, 
with a poison gas pellet that will be destroyed by a quantum decay process and at some time or other, you don't know what time, if you calculate by the equations of quantum mechanics for a given time, is the cat dead or alive at that time, you always get a minimum of two answers. So in one universe, the cat is dead, and in the next universe, the cat is alive, just like me. I'm dead in one universe and alive in another, and so is Schrodinger's cat in that uh, mathematical demonstration. So John F. Kennedy is still alive in some universes because he never went to Dallas in 1962. In some universes, Adolf Hitler is remembered as a, a rather banal painter of sentimental landscapes, if he's remembered at all. Now, all these universes are equally real. None, you can't say one universe is more real than the others. If you think this universe here is the real universe, uh, you're, you're, entire, you're very naive according to the EWG model. All the other universes that you can imagine are just as real as this one. That begins to sound more like Sufism than Buddhism, doesn't it? Uh, then, there's Bell, then there's the uh, uh, hidden variable theory of David Bohm, which is that uh, everything that can happen to the quantum system uh, doesn't happen. There is only one thing happening after all. Unfortunately, what controls the one thing that does happen is a non-local hidden variable. And what's a non-local hidden variable? The non-local hidden variable is spaceless and timeless, so it functions equally throughout space and equally throughout time. And uh, John Bell did a rigorous mathematical uh, demonstration of how a non-local hidden variable of the Bohm sort would have to behave if it existed. And believe it or not, this mathematical demonstration was clear enough that they could actually perform experiments to test it. And every time they've tested it, it's turned out the universe does behave, at least in physics laboratories, as if the non-local correlation does exist. And what this means is, uh, as a friend of mine, a physicist named Nick Herbert, likes to say, there's absolutely no difference between anything. <laughs> or another of, Nick's, another of Nick's ways of explaining the non-local correlation is here is there. Uh, what, what, this, what this means is that any two particles, oh, I slipped and said particles, any two thingamajigs, any two quantum entities that were once in contact continue to be correlated no matter how far apart they go, no matter how much time passes, they're always moving in harmony with each other, just like the dancers in a ballet. This begins to sound even more like Buddhism and Hinduism. This, uh, there's only one thing happening, and everything is related to everything else. This not only sounds like Buddhism and Hinduism, it sounds like uh, magic. Uh, Sir James Fraser in The Golden Bow defined magic as the primitive system of thought which believes that uh, two things that were once connected continue to influence each other. Uh, this is why uh, those into black magic believe if they can get a hold of a piece of your clothing or a hair from your head and do something to that, that will affect you. And Fraser calls this the basic, the first law of magic. Things once in contact continue to influence each other. Well, according to uh, Bell's theorem and uh, seven experiments so far, the universe does work that way. Uh, one, one of the physicists who denies this, uh, uh, Dr. Merman of Columbia University, has written a paper to show we don't have to believe in the non-local correlation in spite of these seven experiments and all the mathematical demonstrations, because these are all based on the fallacy that there's an objective universe. And according to Merman, the real truth about quantum mechanics is there is no objective universe. The moon is not there when nobody's looking. I, I am not... A, I, and. I am not caricaturing Dr. Merman, I am not making fun of him, I am not, that he says that flatly at the end of his article, Quantum Mysteries for Everyone. The moon is not there when nobody is looking. So if you all close your eyes, I'm not here anymore. That's another school of quantum theory. So, so we got the first school, you can't talk about reality. The second school is everything you can think of is real. Everything that could happen did happen. The third is that everything is connected with everything else and so that there is no difference between anything. Uh, very much like the Atman, or the, what the Chinese call Wu Xin, the, the no mind which underlies everything. It's, the, it's called no mind because it's the class of all minds, and the class of all minds is not a mind for the same reason that the class of all red-headed women is not a red-headed woman. Or the class of all chairs is not a chair. That's clear enough, isn't it? I'm talking so much about quantum mechanics because it fascinates me, and I don't give a damn how much it bores you. I talk about what interests me. But uh, 
another, another reason is that this is the hardest of all the hard sciences. This is grappling with the ultimate that we can discover by the experimental method. And uh, the, the fourth way of looking at quantum mechanics is quantum logic, which was invented by John von Neumann. Von Neumann invented the first programmable computer. The whole computer revolution is largely due to von Neumann. He also invented the mathematical theory of games, which is used in the war game computers. I think the reason we're all here is because of von Neumann. Because with his theory of games, they learned how to uh, predict uh, various war game situations. And with the computers, they could run one test after another. And what's been going on since uh, the early 40s is that both sides in the Cold War keep feeding the computers with military strategies and asking if we do this, can we cream the other side without getting creamed ourselves? And the computers say, no, that won't work. <laughs> so they go back and, and do some more experiments. And I think that's why we're all still here. So I think uh, John von Neumann was the, was the Buddha of the 20th century. <laughs> but uh, Besides inventing programmable computers and mathematical game theory, he invented quantum logic. And quantum logic gets around all the problems of quantum uh, mechanics without saying we can't talk about reality, without saying that everything that can happen does happen, and without uh, 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 joining uh, oriental monism like Bell's theorem leads to. Uh, we have always thought in Western culture since Aristotle that the universe has two states, yes or no. True or false, right or wrong, it is or it isn't. According to Aristotelian logic, Schrodinger's cat that I was just talking about is either dead or alive. And it's rather confusing that quantum mechanics says the cat is both dead and alive. According to von Neumann, the answer to that and all the other paradoxes and indeterminacies is that the universe has three states, yes, no, and maybe. And the odd thing is, I, I've, I've been thinking that way all my life, and I always thought I was a freak until I discovered John von Neumann put it into mathematics. And, and we've, been all, we've been hypnotized so much by logicians that most people really believe that things are in either the true state or the false state. And yet, if you stop and think, even without getting into quantum mechanics and advanced mathematics and all that, in your everyday life, most things are in the maybe state. Almost everything you have to deal with. It's very rare you can get something that you're absolutely sure or you, that uh, A is true or you're absolutely sure that not A is true. Most things in daily life are in the maybe state. Small businessmen, uh, business entities, uh, small, small, small. <laughs> I, got, I got a daughter who's a business entity and uh, a very successful one too and uh, I, I learned long ago to say business person but then I decided that there was human chauvinism and I switched to business entity but I just slipped back to businessman out of some kind of mental fatigue or all the funny chemicals people have been giving me since I arrived in Boulder <laughs> or something like that. You see there's always an excuse. Uh, small business entities know damn well that things are in the maybe state most of the time and they go on intuition. There's a very good book about that, Executive ESP. The bigger the firm these days, the bigger the company, the more likely it is they have computers estimating probabilities for them. And the computers very seldom say yes or no. They give you a percentage. Well, what's the probability that this course will be profitable? I seem to be arguing for von Neumann, and I was trying to be objective about all these schools of quantum mechanics. No, I, I definitely lean toward the von Neumann thing. Uh, I think the universe is in the three states, yes, no, and maybe. And that most of our insanity uh, cultural prejudices and all forms of fundamentalism uh, uh, based on our delusion that everything is either yes or no. Most things are in the maybe state. And so frogs falling out of the sky and uh, puma that's wandering around England being seen constantly and even photographed without eating anything, these are denizens of the maybe part of the universe. They're not quite real, but they're not quite unreal either. And this makes sense to me, and I've written a whole book about it called The New Inquisition, if anybody's interested in seeing this idea developed further, further than I can do in a brief talk tonight. We spend a third of our lives in the maybe state. A third of our lives were asleep, and in sleep, we do not put things into the Aristotelian either or category. If you try to recount a dream, you'll find yourself saying, I was walking down Broadway in New York, but at the same time I was in Samoa. That's the kind of thing that goes on all the time in dreams. Uh, Joyce's Finnegan's Wake is written entirely in maybe language. Um, one, one of the words in Finnegan's Wake that I especially love is chaosmos. 
which combines chaos and cosmos. According to Aristotelian logic, everything has got to be either chaotic or cosmic, ordered or disordered. But Joyce creates chaosmos, which is order and disorder at the same time, and that's the way our dreams are. Since we spend a third of our lives there, uh, I think we're more deeply asleep when we're awake, because it's when we're awake that we get hypnotized by logicians and think everything is either a true or false, yes or no, on or off, and we get into these dualisms that blind us. So maybe uh, arguing this, uh, this uh, three-valued logic, I'm really getting back to the Buddhist view after all, that all is one, because uh, in knocking down the two-valued logic, uh, when you, once you introduce the maybe state, you find there's a continuum and things don't split quite as evenly as in Aristotelian logic. But the puka, which is the origin of the concept of God, most of us in the Western world I think we're so sophisticated and blasé. And then if you look at what people do after they get married and have children, you find they're going around hiding Easter eggs. These are people who won't go to church. They won't have anything to do with the church and they won't even sit down and meditate uh, like the Orient. Uh, they, they, they think they're total secularists and yet they bring in these images of the bunny on Easter day and they hide Easter eggs all over the place and they're carrying on this ancient form of pagan uh, fertility religion without even knowing what they're doing. They're in the maybe state, very obviously. They think they're secularists, but they're still pagans. <laughs> and I don't think we're ever going to get rid of the big bunny. I mean, uh, Hugh Hefner has a plane called the big bunny. <laughs> you think you can destroy these archetypes? Uh, <laughs> Of course, there are many gods. Hefner just happens to have imprinted the, the bunny. Imagine if uh, Hefner had imprinted a lobster, what a Playboy club would look like, what kind of costumes those poor young women would have to wear. <clears throat> I think the contemplation of Playboy clubs with young ladies dressed up as lobsters is a, a fitting way to climax this talk.